Welcome everyone to our 172nd webinar that we've we've been doing since uh, since uh, gosh um, 2022 or 2020 March of 2020 when, when we did our first one we we threw some things together I tried to learn some things as fast as I could about how to do webinars when the pandemic hit and uh, this it's this has been great. Uh, Great fun for me, and it and we built quite a community, and and uh, be able to chat and talk and learn and and do all these things that we've done over the past few years. It it, uh, it has been a uh, bright spot in in uh, in an otherwise uh, uh, bad situation. So I've uh, I appreciate you all being here, and uh, and and we're going to move on with another great one here today, uh, our fifth season, uh, the sixth one of our fifth season, and uh, we're going to talk about finding speed with data. A pretty generic term. But it's uh, it's the universal goal for all racers, and and um, and I was chatting with our co-host today, David, over the you know we chat every once in a while, but uh, a, a month or so ago we were chatting, and he was asking some questions, and I was throwing some questions at him, and we were just bouncing stuff back and forth, and uh, and and it finally dawned on me that. Did, I, it had dawned on me before, but it, it it really became clear that you know we're all doing the exact same thing, and I and I wanted to um, not focus necessarily 100% just on dirt cart stuff, but but on the technology that he's using and 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 growing an entire area of technology inside the dirt cart oval world with stuff that uh, that that maybe even some of you guys aren't using, certainly me as well, and and. And, and, and teaching people to become really into this, this amount of information for racers. So I thought it would be great to invite David back. This is his fourth time of joining us. Great to have him here. D David is, a, is an interesting fellow as, as we get to chat all the time. And, and uh, one of the folks that I've really enjoyed talking with because he, he started racing before there was any of this stuff, right? He started kart racing when he was nine years old. I think he's only 18, but, uh, but the, uh, <laughs> you're right, right, Dave. Uh, but um, uh, he's been around dirt cart oval racing since 1990, 34 years he's been around it. So, so he got into it back when it was just tubes and uh, and an engine and uh, and has worked his way through and has helped, has a lot of different hardware on there now, uh, lots of experience, understands chassis, understands dirt, understands all the different things that he's doing and 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 applying this racing data to it, uh, a fun discussion. So, uh, it transitioned on to where most of us have maybe been in the past. He's got a couple of young sons that are uh, racing carts with possibly a third one coming uh, coming along soon to getting in a cart. We'll have him chat about that in a minute with his uh, youngest son, Max. So the um, Cart Speed Solutions is his company. He does this full time. It's what he does. And he spends a lot of time at it, a lot of time doing the training and support and making videos and, and all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, I, uh, I always enjoy talking with him. David, welcome. I appreciate you coming here and joining us again. Hey, thank you, Roger. Uh, I enjoy being here and I appreciate you inviting me back. Uh, I always have a good time doing these webinars. So we're, we're going to go back a little bit this time. We're going to, uh, we're going to, because it's data and it's racing data and, and, and jumping back and, and understanding why we all do it. I, I thought we would go back in your, uh, in your life a little bit and, and chat about how you got started a little bit of the cart racing side, but but more the technology and understanding carts and 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 how you've got it up to here. I think I'm going to stop my my screen share here for just a minute, and we'll and we'll uh, we'll just chat for a minute and and talk about that. So, the um, um oops, that's a, that's, a doo -doo -doo. that's not what I want you to do. You made me sound so interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm really boring. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, no, I'm I'm boring. I, I sit here behind this desk all the time and chat with people, right? But the, the um, you uh, I'd like to to chat with you just a minute about how, how did you get to be where you're at? You're you're kind of taking the lead on technology and go kart racing and dirt kart oval uh, racing, certainly in that specific genre of of, of dirt carts. But the um, how did you get here? Uh, you know, I I seen on your website. That I don't remember the year that it was, but uh, you, you ended up with a Digitron was the was the first data logger that you the first display at least that, that you had. Give us a little bit of a background of of um, how you got into this carding stuff, especially taking off from the from the data gathering side. <clears throat> well, to be honest, so it actually started really early on, and not not that I was doing data work when I was like younger, no, but. Like, like you said, I started in August of 1990, 
And back then, all we had was they had Digitrons. I can't remember what the number was, but all it showed you was RPMs. And then if you wanted to see head temp, you had to hit a button, and then all you saw was head temp. So what you would have to do as a nine-year-old, my dad would tell me, right before you go into the turn, you have to look down and try to remember the RPM number before heading into the turn, which is the most critical part <laughs> of, of, of the turn, right? Which I was completely horrible at. I've missed a turn nine out of ten times. <laughs> and so um, that's kind of how – that's what we had – in. And then as racing evolved, then we got the can't remember the number of the Digitron. I, I see it in my, my, my head. It was it was a dual display Digitron where it would give you max RPM readings. And then if you wanted to use memory, it had a button on the side which you push. So at the time that came out, that was like 92, 93. And I remember being at Four Way Raceway in South Carolina. It was the first weekend we used it. And I was so excited because I had a button on the side of it, and, and the, the tack <laughs> sat on the steering wheel. So I was I was going down the back straightaway, and all of a sudden, this is in practice, I completely run off the racetrack <laughs> and over to the wood line. I come back on, and I go into the, to the, to the pits. My dad is freaking out going, what are you doing? I was like, I was trying to hit the button, and I completely missed the turn, <laughs> the, whole, the whole track and everything. So he was like, after that, he was like, don't worry about that dang button. Just, just drive. <laughs> so, um, so that was like my early experiences with tax. But so in, in 93, 94, you know, when, when, whenever we used to weigh out go-karts, we used to do it with bathroom scales, right? Cause there wasn't, um, electronic scales like you have now. It's well, there was electronic scales, but if you had electronic scales, you were really big time. Because they were like four thousand, five thousand dollars back in nineteen ninety four. That's like, I mean, three or four thousand dollars now is a lot of money. That's like big time, money, big. right? Yeah, for, for go kart racing, it, yeah. So, um, what we ended up using, my dad was working at GE at the time, and he um, he had a laptop for work, and that's when Excel first came out, and he came up with he came up with a program in Excel where. Instead of having to do the math on a calculator, you put the, the the four weights in, and it will pop out. You know your cross percentage or wedge for you race car guys, um, <laughs> left side percentage, nose, you know that kind of thing. And he also had one because he built engines, so he had a dyno. So he put where he put in the humidity and the barometric pressure and whatever, and it pop out the horsepower of an engine. And I remember sitting there at our shop thinking. Wouldn't it be cool? And I know this is going to sound cheesy, but this is the God honest truth. I was like, wouldn't it be cool if you were at the racetrack and you could just put in what the go kart was doing, and the computer would tell you exactly what you needed to do? Yeah. And I remember having that thought very vividly. And so, fast forward, you know, I went through, you know, where they all the innovations in the car racing from straight chassis to offset chassis to then they went to small tubing to big tubing to um, fixed front ends, to fully adjustable caster and camber front ends. Um, and then I took a break for a few years because my family opened up a business. And then my little boy decided to get into racing. So I was like, you know what, we'll, we'll venture back into car racing. And so about that time, it was 2015 when we were talking about going back racing. Um, and in 2016, I bought a Micron 5. <laughs> and I remember like reading through the owner's manual going, this thing's amazing. Yeah, it will tell you where your, your, your minimum RPM is. It will show you on the screen. It will be like an automated lap. I'm like, oh my gosh, if I just had that information back in 1999 and 2001 and 2002, you know. And so, um, and then I kind of looked and saw where you could download Brake Studios. And so I started downloading it and playing around with it. Um, and watching a few videos and then, uh, one day I decided, I was like, you know what, to really understand this stuff, why don't I just call AIM? So I called AIM and I think I called the California office. I'm not really sure which office I actually talked to. And they gave me, you know, Roger's email and huh? the Lord Jesus, you know, blessed me. And, and it's funny how God opens doors like that. Right. Um, 
started talking with Roger, built a really good friendship with Roger, and choo 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 choo, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's funny, I um, I, I do remember. I think you left a message or something, or maybe might have been an email, but and it was probably late at night. I, I don't remember, but the uh, I remember answering back, and you uh, and you replied back. Oh, I didn't expect to. I didn't expect to get an answer that quick or something, right? And because um, I, I, I really wasn't expecting an answer at all. To be honest, <laughs> check my email all the time, and and, uh, and I think we set up a, a phone call or something. Uh, you know, two or three days later, when we both had time, and we started to chat about stuff. And 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 your approach is what uh, what I really like. And when and uh, and this was what this had to be four or five years ago, right? I mean, I don't remember how long ago it was. It's it's been a while. Uh, maybe longer than I think we're. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah, it's been a while. And the yeah. uh, but what I really like is when, when people contact me and, and I will help anybody, right? That's and something that you follow that same that same thought process. You help everybody you can, you do it. But what I really, really what 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 makes it great for me is when you're trying to help somebody, they ask a question and they and they're asking it and and it's registering and the and and, and the conversation moves forward pretty quickly, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where you were at. You were, you were really hungry for the information and fairly new to the to what we were doing. And it was like, okay, boom. And then a couple of days later, an email that, okay, I'm, this is what I'm doing. Does this look right to you? <laughs> yeah, that is. You're on. You keep on going. Keep on heading that direction. Uh, as you were learning, you, uh, you 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 took a pretty steep path, right? And um, and you started to uh, you taking your Micron five data at first, and it was just RPM and, and GPS speed, and uh, and you started to roll other things into that fairly quickly. What do you remember doing as you were doing that? You started well, adding you know, other I mean, things. I'm, I'm, I always believe that God uh, qualifies the call, and sometimes, man, you know. God just opens up your brain and you start understanding it. It starts speaking your language and it's kind of, I don't know, it's really hard to explain because it, because I've, I'm, I've known chassis dynamics. Like when we, when we used to race in the nineties, that's all there was. Like, I mean, we had tire prep and we did things with tires, right? We had different tire compounds and stuff like that. But where you really found speed was, you know, taking cross or wedge out of the go-kart and cross in, you know, changing left side percentage and doing all these changes so from that aspect, I really understood chassis dynamics and how, you know, when you change front end geometry, this is how the go-kart is going to react, right? Well, when I started looking at the data, I'm going, oh, my gosh, it will tell you where you're losing bite and where you're getting – well, rip, I shouldn't say bite. That's what's, what's carding slang. It's okay. Hard. Everybody understands. Um, but, you know, it, it's showing you where you're losing grip and where you're gaining grip. It's showing you where the, the, the go-kart is wanting to rotate. And that's where – you know, back then I would have I would have probably strangled somebody if somebody told me I could get this data. You know what I'm saying? I would I'd probably rain down the track naked if somebody was like, "Hey, listen, we'll give you." Oh, great! Oh, yeah, great! Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, straight up. So, so that's what fascinated me with it is the fact that. Okay, so here's here's the cool thing about data. I'll, I'll really put it out there. You can be at the racetrack, and I don't care if you're racing, car. You know, road course. You know, Indy car, stock cars, Formula One, Trans Am, if you're cool enough to be Matt Romanowski, you know, how, you know, whatever. Sometimes you make an adjustment. And without race data, right? Okay, let's say you make a run. And let's say your lap is 12 seconds. You come in, you make a chassis adjustment, whatever it is, shocks, wedge, whatever you want it to be. And then you make a you make another run, and it's like 12 it's still 12 flat or 12002 or something like that. Something really close. Or if you're only using a stopwatch, you go, well, that didn't really make a difference. And sometimes the driver will come in and say, I didn't really feel anything different. So you go, okay, well, that didn't really work out a lot. Well, with race data, you can go in and you can start breaking down feet, individual, you know, feet of a lap or a foot of a lap to see what actually is happening. And you'll find oftentimes that no two laps are built the same. You can see where, Oh man, the adjustment we made picked up two or three tenths almost the whole lap, and then all of a sudden, you know, lost all of this mojo. Fifty foot coming out of turn four or turn eleven or whatever it is, yeah. and now I can I can focus my changes to one particular spot on the racetrack. Where are we struggling at? I will focus on my adjustments there instead of just being so general and broad 
you know, which is what the stopwatch gives you. You and know, you, being and, able to. And just the other night, yeah. you were sharing with me that, um, you know, you could get bite in the corner. It w you could do some things, and and we were talking about different areas to get more grip in the corner, but it actually would slow you down on the straightaway, and that then wouldn't show as a lap time. Wow. You you were picking up in the corners, but slowing down on the straightaways. You almost had to have the data in order to get that right to understand what was happening. Interesting. Sure. Or from from a driver standpoint, right? You can make the adjustment on a go kart, and this is because I've seen this recently. And in the the go kart is a tenth, tenth and a half faster. However, the drive the, the actual lap time is the same. And the reason why the lap time is the same is because the driver took twelve more feet in that lap than what he did the previous lap or the but, previous run. His 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 distance per lap is like so. Then you go, oh, well, I don't have a go kart problem. This is driver related. You know the uh, and then it stops I, I, a lot of wild goose yeah, absolutely. I, I look at some of your data sometimes, and um, Matt asked the question in, in the chat box real quickly was, how long is a lap? You just said go 12 feet farther when it's only 800 feet or or 900 feet per lap, right? That 12 feet is a, is a percentage, right? It's not like a four-mile track. So that uh, that's actually a big deal to understand that. I'll tell you a quick story. So we were at Low Country Carway. This has been like two, three, maybe even four years ago. I mean, it's been a few years ago. And, you know, we were looking at the lap times, and the lap times were actually the fastest we've ever seen the race drive, right? Well, in dirt racing, if the lap times are getting faster, then naturally you think, oh, well, the track has a whole lot more grip to it, right? So we were like, man, so we were making adjustments trying to, 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 to free up the, the go-kart and every time we made adjustment to free it up we just slowed down and i'm like that something's not making sense <laughs> well a friend of mine we were we were standing on the racetrack he was like you know i wonder i wonder if the track's the same size and now i was like then it's like one of those light bulb moments hmm so then i go back in the trailer i pull up you know race studios go in there and start looking at the footage for lap and realize that daggone it this track is 40 foot shorter than it was three <laughs> months ago and then, so I went to the fastest part of a lap and took and took the delta function and measured out 40 foot at the fastest part, and it was four tenths of a second. Yeah. But when you added that four tenths of a second, the track's actually slower. So ah. then when we started biting the go kart, all of a sudden we picked up pace and started really, really started making speed. But the things like the that, man, clou clouds lifted, and you understood why things were happening. Interesting. Right. It's it's very much like a crime scene detective. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, data. Yeah, look for red flags. Look for you know things like yeah. that. The 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 before we jump into where we're where I want to go next, which is what are you doing currently with 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 your carts and with lots of customers now? You 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 help a lot of different people. The um the the, the big difference that um, the power of Race Studio three versus two, right? There is some power in they're very similar with a lot of things, but one of the the neatest things about Built, baked into Race Studio 3 now is that distance function is no longer just the segment where Race Studio 2 was kind of, uh, it, it didn't ha it wasn't based on GPS information. So it wasn't an actual rolling distance. It was the length of the segment you built, right? Wow. So the uh, so now with Ray, with your Micron 5 and Race Studio 3, that all of us are using now the analysis in Race Studio 3, all of these distances, when you measure something, it you, you may have went up the hill and then back down on on your on your circle track, and and it knows exactly how far you actually traveled, not a point to point, right? And that is a that is a big deal, and it's what a lot of people have struggled with. Race Studio Three, when they are comparing data to two versus three, especially in the time compare bar, the uh, with with the super stretch and some and some things that AIM is doing that uh, sometimes the time compare numbers look different with the same exact data in the two different programs, Race Studio 3 being much more accurate and more consistent and typical of more representative of what is happening than Race Studio 2 maybe was in, in certain circumstances. So it's kind of interesting. The um, uh, Currently, you're, you're out there running around and, uh, and, in, and in Dirt Cart Oval in the past, you've got the Micron Heck, we started with microns and then twos, then threes, then fours. And it sounds like your first micron was a five. The um, A lot of people in that world use, they put on microns and everything. They call it their the TAC, right? It's it's just, it's yeah. and, uh, the TAC. And uh, they, um, but it really was just an RPM gauge and lap times. That's what was it's used for, for years. People use them in that way and, and still 
you know, to some point, a lot of them still do, but you've turned that into the Micron 5 is a, is a powerful tool. It's very much in line with the rest of the AIM devices that all most people sitting here know about. The um, you, you're, You've been adding stuff to them. What kind of stuff are you doing that is a little bit outside of what uh, what we used to do in, in dirt car oval racing? We, so, yeah, I pick on people a lot because a lot of people just use it for, for lap times. I'm like, man, that's a really expensive stopwatch you got here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah so so i mean it's 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 escalated pretty quickly um you know right now you know we use steering sensors we have pedal position sensors we use onboard tire temp sensors where before you know tire temps in kart racing late 90s early 2000s was a really big thing like you didn't show up to the racetrack without a barometer and some people even had the fancy ones with the memory right yeah. well People got away from that, and the reason being is because car racing, and I don't know about car racing and, and, and road course racing, but in dirt car racing, a lot of the tires are going to a synthetic rubber where it's not a natural rubber. So the, the tire dissipates heat really fast. So you can't get an accurate reading with a tire probe anymore. By the time you're able to get to the go-kart, the tire's cooled off enough where the, the reading is not accurate. So people quit doing it. Well, with onboard tire temp sensors, now it's measuring, you know, a tenth of a foot of every lap of what the temperature is. So now I can watch the, the tire heat up, watch the tire cool down. And with us in car racing where, you know, there are no tire rules as far as in flat car racing, the kind of racing that I do where you can use chemicals, you can cut tires, you can, you know, you can do all kinds of things to the tires. Getting that information is paramount, you know. But then also on top of that, man, looking at, you know, estimated tire loads, um, seeing how, you know, the, the tire load versus tire temp, you know, because the big thing with us too is, is spring rates. Because we don't have um, suspensions like race cars, the tire then becomes a suspension. So spring rates and sidewalls are really, really, really big thing. Well, unfortunately, using spring um, um, sidewall testers, you know, spring rate testers, it is really difficult because whenever you whenever you use them, the, the readings you get are very consistent tire to tire, enough to, to track trends. So now with using these estimated load channels with tire temps, I can now see where the actual sidewall is starting to stored under load. And now I can see between different brands of tires and different sidewalls how the, the tire reacts and then what kind of adjustments I need to do to the go kart to to satisfy the tire. Like for instance, you know the the maxi tire has a stiffer sidewall than the HBM Reaper tire. So then I know now because of that, I I know what chassis adjustments to make to 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 load the tire correctly. Let let's let let's kind of tie this back into what I kind of started with a little bit. You, you've been watching some of these webinars with us, you know, often mm -hmm. quietly in the background, maybe uh, maybe messing with Matt a little bit, uh, joking about with Matt. But but um, you watched one of our webinars with with Ray Phillips and yes. something you just touched on. And one of the Thank things you, Ray, Marshall, Ray yeah. did, Matt, Matt will probably uh, link it here in, in the chat box in a minute. All of the links, by the way, for those of you who are watching this later on YouTube that we're going to that we've either talked about or will talk about as we go are going to be in the description below the. Um, where Ray talked about uh, using just basic data, no shock sensors and tire pr t yeah. pressure, all, all that stuff, to to any 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 shared the math channels with with everybody of being able to use longitudinal and lateral g forces and estimate the tire loads and on a on a road race car and uh, mm -hmm. and he's used that to good. Uh, to, to, to good service for himself and, and several of the folks that he's worked with. You took that from that webinar talking about going across different platforms and forms of motorsports. You took that and went immediately to your dirt cart and started to apply this exact same thing on your dirt carts and have found some pretty good, uh, pretty good information from that. How's that worked out for you? It works out really well. So yeah, so, so I took um, Ray's, Ray was nice enough to share the, the, the math channel. So I took Ray's, um, load channel and then i uh put it into a, um to a load formula that ended up pumping out um it moves it from lateral g's to weights which makes it easier for us because now because i deal with a lot of preloads on tires yeah. so now i can see it in, in pounds 
not so much G force, right? Which makes it easier for me to when I when I'm setting up a go kart statically, how much how much foil, how much static weight is turning dynamic, right? So that becomes um, extremely powerful. It you know it's not and people ask me all the time, well, is it the same as a load cell? No, it's not the same as a load cell. It's not as accurate as what a load cell would be, but the way it reads, which Ray is ingenious with this, is because it uses lateral and longitudinal acceleration, it's consistent. And really, that's the most important part, is, is because it reads consistently, now I can make changes chassis-wise and then look at the changes when the weights turn dynamic and know that the reading I'm getting is consistent. Some of you that are watching this, uh, that are that are road, we, we have a pretty heavy road racer, you know, type of folks here, or or bikes and and some karting. But but when you're doing left turn only, like David is 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 working with, it becomes very, the focus becomes very very sharp, uh, and and what that cart does, and and how it's loading the different corners is is a big deal. And then the track changes in dirt tracks from beginning of a of a of an event till the end, let alone during the day to night and then uh, uh, on top of that and then say you're going to go to a new track and it has different banking so everything you just learned on this 800 foot track that may be looking like it's exactly the same shape now if one corner is banked more than the other end it actually is reacting differently and this uh, and I and I know from speaking with you this you're able to see things uh, with these with these numbers that have been able to help you yeah it's it's been a game for me personally I think it's a game changer it really is a game changer. And, and, you know, it's, I can't tell you how much stuff that I've learned from, from road racers like Matt and, and Ray that don't, that, that aren't even in my form of motorsports that I've been able to apply into my, because physics is physics. There you go. There yeah, you it, go. it is. It's all math and science. It's all it is, right? And so, just like you said, man, where my obstacles, might be different than their obstacles but the physics is still the same so like with these load channels you know if i'm if i'm getting certain loads at this racetrack and it's got this certain turn radius when i go to another racetrack that has the same turn radius with the same banking you know with the same kind of dirt then i'm i'm using that information to go to that strike now start there yeah right if we go to a bigger track with the turn radius is different well then that's a different game, you know. But again, it's like I always say, you know, the more information you have, the better decision you make. The better decision you make, the faster you go. And and uh, the you've got now you've got that stuff that you're able to look at later, and and then you bring in the tire temperatures that are happening in that tenth of a second. Right. And right when the thing is loading up, you can see what the tire does. You can see what the driver did with the wheel to uh, to and, and how that affected temperatures and pressures and loads. And uh, the, the data is a is a, is a self-circling eats itself. Maybe it's maybe is a better way to put it. Right. But but it's uh, it feeds upon itself. But you uh, you end up with a lot of information that is that is helpful to you. It's pretty interesting. I would think man, data is one of the things, you know, when we started doing data years ago, it. I really geek out over it. I'm not going to lie. And like where I, it just, it turns into a rabbit hole, right? I think you told me it's like an onion. Like you peel back a layer and there's another layer and another layer. And then six hours later, you're still digging in. To and you know, let, you it. feel like you know less than what you did when you started. That's the problem. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even but though you know, you know a lot more. <laughs> you know what I also find really helpful? It's everybody takes note. I don't, I don't care if, if you're, you know, asphalt oval, you know, asphalt road course dirt oval everybody takes notes right because if you have an event that you go to and let's say you roll out and you snot lick them by a half a lap or whatever you're going to try your best as a racer to recreate that event right the next time you're at said racetrack right while well, like how me and you were talking the other day because of race data and the way you know race studios work you know i was able to pull back we went to a racetrack of uh, a few weeks ago, I was able to look back on data from five years ago and, and, and start digging into the decisions that were made, what was good decisions and what were bad decisions, and, and start <coughs> narrowing down what kind of tire the racetrack likes, what kind of gear ratio the racetrack likes, 
what kind of chemical on the tire the racetrack likes and all these things. So when we go to the racetrack, I've already got my game plan set of the decisions that I'm going to make. Why? Because we got, we, I've tracked, I've already tracked trends for, for so many years at this racetrack, you know? It's funny you say that just today I had a, a user contacted me over the last three or four days, but, but uh, a motorcycle uh, group, uh, and they were they were sharing some data and they had had data i they had shared data with me in the past i had data from three different events over three years of them attending the same track on the same bikes right and then there was a question today of of some things and i go uh, in an email so i brought up their data from before and they were thinking that one of their guys had maybe making a lot more power because all of a sudden he got a lot faster right there was one lap times who were coming down as they were getting better and they were had in their mind that it probably was power looked back in the data actually about on the straightaways the lot the time compare bar is flat and everywhere from the middle of the corner out gain time middle corner out gain time and i was able to go right back to them and bring them up on a zoom call and so okay here's how you would handle this right this is how you you know the, the value of this data is powerful of, of keeping your old data because look at this you your 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 increase in, in, in skills are, are paying off, right? The power, if anything, the one fellow that thought it was power on the straightaway, the bike was actually losing time on the straightaway, only a 10th or so, but, uh, but where they thought they were making it all was actually, maybe the bike was actually down a tick from before. So it was kind of funny, but the, um, you, you mentioned, well, you know, go ahead, go ahead. Well, it's kind of like what we were just talking about just a little bit ago. You're able, instead of looking at just the lap times, now you're pinpointing areas there in a go. lap where the, the, the car or the motorcycle was faster at versus where it's slower at. And, mean, Dave, that- and David, you have learned a lot of things. And I know there was some coaching for me at first to, to start you down this road, but then you've a taken, it, taken it a long way with it. But but breaking down the track maps now, you, you actually look at, whenever you show me data, it's, You've taken and thrown away the the standard Race Studio three track map location splits, and you've built them where you want them because it's how you, you know, it's the middle oh, of the corner yeah. off, or it's the you know the entry part of the corner, you know, all these different things, and and it's uh, you're learning things, and it's exactly how everybody else that that uses these tools begins to do it. Yours just happens to be on an 800 foot lap where your your data is very zoomed in right when you start, where a, a road racer is looking at four miles of data, you're looking at 800 feet, right? So it, it's interesting. The other one other thing on current stuff that I'd like to chat about before we go into you know, maybe some of the services and, and, and some future stuff. You also were one of the I think a, a number of people were doing this before, but you threw a speed, a rear axle speed sensor on the cart pretty quickly. And um, and I thought that was intriguing. And and um, uh, I remember chatting with you as we, as you were thinking this through and what you what you're trying to get. And it was there was a big piece on clutches for you and understanding the clutch so you could understand the tires even better, you know, and the, and the goop that you put on these things and, and the games you guys play with tires, but that rear axle speed, that was something you did. You have your GPS and it's, and it's powerful and it's good that it does a lot of work for you, but having that direct link of the rear axle speed through the clutch, through the two gears and up to the clutch, mm. uh, uh, the, the crankshaft RPM, helped you understand clutches a little bit what kind of work have you done on that and and helped other people well yeah so so before before race data or any using computers and in the manner that we are before for the micron you know how we used to 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 set your clutch was you sit on the stand you hold the you hold the back tire and you give the gas and you look at the tag and look at the rpm until it engages right and do you feel it start tugging at your hand and you're like, all right, I think we're at 3,400, and you, you just on your clutch. Well, now, man, we're able to go into the computer and look at the clutch engaging in real time under load, which is huge. Because what the, the clutch engages free spinning on a stand with no weight on it versus what it engages when you have a 375-pound pound, go-kart that is trying to lunge forward is different, right? Yeah. Not to mention – there was no way to gauge how the clutch performed after after lockup. Like the only way you would know that if you had a clutch slipping is if the driver felt it. And by that time, 
It was so blown apart yeah. that it cost you a race, and you either had to pull off the track or you were so far behind it was ridiculous. And it cost so you a lot of money because it's now it's junk. It's got to get rebuilt totally. So now we can, yeah. So now we can look when the clutch locks up, special to actual speed sensor. You know, RPM is nothing but crank speed, right? So with every increase for crank speed, I should see an increase of axle speed. And if I don't see an increase in axle speed, then something's slipping. And nine out of ten times, it ends up being the clutch. I mean, it yeah. could be the chain or the gear hub, but a lot of times those are fixed to the point where it's the clutch. And so you could see it. You know, I had a I had a customer one time. He was like, he said, David. I've changed caster, I've changed camber, I've changed left side percentage, I've changed nose percentage, I've changed cross. He's like, I've done everything that you could possibly think of to do. And this thing is a straight up pig on turn exit. It is it is a lead weight coming off the turn, and I don't know what to do. I'm I'm about to quit. I was like, well, let's throw an axle speed sensor on there. Let's just take a look. Come to find out when the go-kart would go on the turn and start loading and building um lateral G's. The clutch would start slipping. And as soon as it started unloading and getting on the straightaway, the clutch would, would, would start, you know, grabbing again. And it would and, feel like it was bog, bogging down, right? Right. So so what it ended up being was just a bad clutch. It changed the clutch, and that solved this problem. Wow, off and running. And and just the other day, we were chatting and uh, and chatting about the difference of a cold clutch versus a hot clutch. And hot clutch, yeah. and, and that is that. And and you've done a little bit of work on that, and, and it will continue on in the in the future. It's kind so, of interesting. So what's impressive? So you have a lot of. Uh, we worked with a few different chassis companies, and I've done a lot of testing for customers. And before, what you would do is you would go out and make a run you know, make a change, then go out and make another run and make a change and whatever. And the problem is you had a hard time keeping an eye on like the clutch and clutch performance. Well, now because we have action speed sensors and we have, you know, microns and, and brake studios three, now I can look and go, okay, you know, between each run, how's the clutch working? If it, is the clutch failing on us? Because the clutch failing on us, stop the test session. We have an issue. There's no sense in making any other runs we have something that's failing. I remember that's, when we first started talking, you you didn't even know at that point. I remember the one, I think our first conversation was, or one of the first ones was, Roger, I don't know if my clutch is even slipping on restarts, right? It, it, I don't know where where I am versus a slow restart versus a normal restart versus a, a, a slow down in the corner, right? So you were having, you were learning a lot really quickly with the, uh, with, with at that point, just GPS speed, but then you, that fine tunes it when you have that axle speed even more. So. Another thing that I really enjoy that, and this is the last thing I'll say about the axle speed sensor, I don't want to hold you up, Roger, but uh, one thing that I find really intriguing with the axle speed is judging roll resistance in the go-kart. Like when you make an adjustment, okay, let's say we make run A, right? And then I make a, a camber adjustment that picks the power up off the racetrack a little bit more. Then being able to do run B and judging the roll resistance of the go-kart, is it rolling easier or, or is it struggling with roll resistance? Because we are low horsepower racing with a big tire. Like, you know, we have a nine-inch slick with only like 14 horses. So <laughs> roll resistance is a big deal for us. So being able to look at that, I think, is also a game changer. Yeah, you have that fight of uh, of making sure that it turns, a lot of tire, a lot of stagger, a lot of all these different things you do, a lot of chemicals. And then then all of a sudden you straighten up the cart and you got to go down the straightaway when now this axle is fighting you. The, the two rear tires are fighting each other and it, and it pulls it down. So it, interesting uh, dynamics of, of, of what uh, some of the different things you fight than, than, than what others do. One of the things you do a lot nowadays, uh, since you've been doing this full time now, you've been uh, you, you, you've set up a process where you, you've found a lot of folks that are also wanting to learn more about going fast with their dirt oval carts and and you have services that you've been doing. The uh, and I and I see it a lot from people on uh, uh, on Facebook or something that right on your Facebook page. Boy, David helped me with X. Right, we we chatted about chassis setup. We chatted about tires, uh, you know, tire temperatures or whatever. <clears throat> what are some of those services that you find that uh, the typical dirt cart oval folks are, are 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 using that you're able to do now with with some of the tools you have with the Micron Fives? Yeah, so we provide a few different services for um, for car racing. Um, one, we do what we call data reports, where if the customer, you know, wants to maximize um, 
their micron, uh, but don't really understand how to use race studios yet, uh, or just kind of getting their feet wet. But you know, they're they're running a race team. They they're going to races, and racing's expensive, no matter what form racing you do. Yeah. Saying so they want to do good, so they'll send me you know data files, and I'll analyze the data, break it down, and put it in a in a comprehensive uh, re report for them to, to read and I email it back to them. Um, I also do uh, data meetings where they send me the files. I'll look at them and then we get together on Zoom um, and talk through their data so they can see my computer, what I'm what I'm seeing. And then we talk about, you know, from the areas I find that we need improvement, what kind of adjustments that we can make, whether it be to the chassis or to the power program that we can find speed. Um, we do test sessions. Um, we do track sites for we'll come out and we'll um, we'll stay in their trailer all day long. Every time the go-kart comes out or goes on the track and comes off, we'll pull the data, break it down, and we'll be in the customer's trailer talking through what the data says versus what adjustments they should make for the next time out. Like I have a lot of pro teams that like to do that, especially on big time races um, that you know they're running. Because sometimes some of these go-kart races they're running for fifteen, twenty thousand yeah. dollars, and so I'll have some pro teams. Pro teams don't like to talk about it, but they'll, they'll have me hidden in the trailer. Yeah. You know, they'll throw me a ham sandwich every now and then. I was just going to say, do they have you wearing a big hat and and, and sunglasses, and no, nobody gets to know you're there, right? You have and to come like, come in in dark and leave after dark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, so, so we do that. Um, we help people with their microns. Some of them, you know, they. They uh, they want to update them, but they don't want to go through the rigmarole of trying to download the program, trying to figure it out. So they'll send me their microns, and I'll, I'll you know I'll set them up for them, update their track database, you know that kind of thing to help them out. So yeah, yeah, perfect. And, and then and then you have an entire um, uh, area where you have a YouTube page, and and of course mm -hmm. your Facebook Facebook tips and, and 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 all sorts of things like that. And I I really like your YouTube videos. You there's there's a little bit of humor in there and there's a little bit of fun and you're but yet you're talking about something that uh, everybody really wants to you know know, know and learn about but yet you, you throw a little twist in there occasionally which is kind of fun so my pastor one time told me when I was younger he said David the heart can only handle what the butt can endure so I try <laughs> to make it as entertaining as I possibly can there you uh, go but yeah well we do webinars too you know if people want to learn how to do you know, to, to, to analyze their data, we have webinars set up for that. We have webinars helping with tire programs, all kind of things. Because we're built on trying to support the racers, trying to help them get the most out of their equipment. And I think that's where, like, race data is really beneficial because, you know, I think race data to a point, and I think this is in every genre of racing, regardless of road racing or whatever, where people really think that race data is extremely expensive and, oh, man, it's going to cause the overhead for my race team to go dramatically up. And I think it's the opposite because when you when you start digging into the data, you get more information. Man, it helps you get the most out of your equipment. It helps cut down on, on useless uh, waste spending, you know, especially in good car racing. Dude, if I can, if I can look at the data – and, and see what kind of tires I need. And I only have to go to the racetrack with five sets of tires versus 40 sets of tires. That's cheaper. Yeah, absolutely. The way you that's cheaper. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and virtually every cart out there has Micron five on it. So it's, it's, it's just, you're creating a culture. You're, you're, you're building a culture of, of using a tool that almost all of them already have and using it better. And there's nothing more that me being a representative of aim can, can, can enjoy than somebody like you out there give it adding value to the product that uh, that they've purchased and uh, i think it's just a, i think it's a wonderful thing and that's why i why i enjoy it so much the um i tell people, I tell people all the time you know why not do it you've already made the investment you've exactly. already put the money to do it learning it learning is another big investment obviously that's the second one right and uh you know you, doesn't you, cost you anything it doesn't cost but it costs a lot of time and and you know and some people are, are busy but but it's uh but but most of them are deep racers and they really want to get better and and just they already know the bottom line of what they need they just need to learn how this tool, little tool can help them fill in the gaps right and understand what they're what they're getting quicker it's it's pretty interesting to me future what 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 happens in the future what um 
you, you've you've uh, you've started to create this culture in in dirt cart oval in the southeast and and around uh, around the east coast really but but um and and you're starting to people you rent out i know sometimes the speed sensor the the uh, a speed sensor or a tire temperature kit for somebody that only needs it for a that's test or something point. yeah, yeah was, uh, something other people do as well and and i think that's so valuable because now they get a taste of it and and they go you know what this is this does save me money maybe right. it's something that some we ought to, to do ourselves so a uh, very good idea how's that program going for you where you either loan them or rent them out it's going pretty good like a lot of times when people go test and and they want to try like tire temp sensors or steering sensors, but again, they don't want to make the financial commitment. Yeah. It allows them to rent them and try them. And, and a lot of times <laughs> when people rent them, they're buying them the next week because they're like, oh my gosh, I just didn't know. You know, because it, it is, it's a really slippery slope. As my grandfather used to tell me, son, if it's cool, it's, it is something you're going to get, you're going to dive in with both feet, you know, and that's, <laughs> and that's cool. you know, so, um, but, um, but yeah, so what I'm going to try to venture in to, uh, in the next six months, a couple of years, I want to dive into oil strain gauges. I've talked to Matt about that a little bit and cause I want to see the more, you know, the more you, um, the more you understand it, the more you can manipulate it to get it to do what you want it to do in a race. And that's, that's what's big, right? Um, especially when the situation is not conducive. To what what you normally want it to do, um, so I want to look into foil strain gauges and start looking at you know tubing dynamics because one thing that I've learned with with race data is sometimes things don't work the way you assume they worked in the past. You know how it gets there might be completely opposite of what you really thought happened. So I feel like that will be that's going to be the next um, adventure into. I want to see. Uh, tube tube and movement on race chassis. I'm also uh, looking into um, you know taking uh, using the smarty cams a little bit more, looking at the tire uh, in real time. I want to see the tire distort under load um, because again the smarty cams are are super cool because when they sync the data uh, with the video. So now I want to see the go kart load the tire load in the turn, and I want to watch the tire distort. And what see, is that tire doing to create these is, graphs that exactly I'm seeing? Yeah, exactly. Right. Because if I understand that, then I can make the go-kart faster. So that's kind of where I'm going to venture into uh, next because I think that's going to be – that's that's the next frontier, right? Because before, you know, it's a lot of trial and error. Well, now I, I'm getting away from trial and error. I want to make educated decisions on chassis-wise what the go-kart is actually doing so we can – Find more speed. That's what it's about. Yeah. Now, right? Tr truly engineering the cart, right? At that point, right? You, using that information. One of the things you do with the tire temperatures that I that I thought was pretty interesting that uh, that uh, that many of uh, our road racing uh, users may not under may not think of. You got a dirt cart, and while all four tires need to do work, th that left front is the one of 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 if any of them doesn't do a ton, right? And uh, so you get a four tire go kart Micron Five tire infrared tire temperature kit and you put three of them on the tires and you take one and you point it straight down up on that on the, on the front corner and get actual dirt track tire temp, uh, track temperatures uh, that uh, most of us wouldn't think that you're on a dirt track i mean it's what how what difference could it make right but in reality the way your guys's dirt tracks are they are so prepared and so so fantastic talk a little bit about that track temperature and the and versus tire temperature Okay, so you know how you were saying that that race data, regardless of what motorsport you're doing, it, it, it transcends, right? Because what works in road course racing also will work in oval racing. So I gotta give kudos to Matt Romanowski on this one because I got this I got this idea from him. So he was I don't think he was subtracting the left front like I was. <laughs> he added he added a fifth one. He, right? he exactly. just added a fifth one. <laughs> exactly. But I was like what I found was the left front you know, it does work when it when we go into the turn on turn entry for about I don't know ten to twenty foot, but then it becomes so unloaded that the temperature cools down. Well, because of that, I was like, okay, well, if I'm not getting a whole lot of value from that that tire and that temperature sensor, I saw Matt and I was like, hey, that's a great idea. So I decided to take to do what Matt does and point the the temperature 
down on the track right behind the right front tire. So I have track temperature right where the right side tires are right. Oh. Why that's important? Because if you're testing and turns one and two are overcast and in the shade, I would say, but turns three and four in the sun, if I see all of a sudden you go around turns three and four and the tire temperatures just dramatically increase, your first thought is, well, the go-kart is starting to slide. We're losing grip because the tire sliding is building friction. Friction produces heat. But if you notice, if you look at the track and you go, oh, no, the 20 degrees that that the tires gained was because the track was 20 degrees hotter. But then it's not a go-kart issue. It's a track issue. And and the track and the dirt of of the the clay oval that you guys run on gets so hard packed and so much rubber laid down that temperatures are a uh, can be ver variable top to bottom right soft up in the marbles versus down in the down at the bottom well, in, a, in a hard and, packed groove. Yeah, and in in what I want to um, I don't know uh, the participants that are listening, um, and I don't know how familiar they are with dirt car racing, but dirt car racing is a little bit different than dirt car racing. To the fact that dirt cart racing or dirt car racing, a lot of the tracks are a little bit wetter, right? Well, our flat carts, we run on like super dry, for the most part, super dry racetracks, especially on the East Coast, where the tracks are so compact. Like if you take a durometer out to them, a lot of times they're reading 95 to 100 uh, on the durometer, which is just about as hard as metal, you know, yeah. or asphalt. And they're, they have just about as much grip as asphalt. Well, and some of the data that you that you see on on uh, some of our previous webinars that we've done together, Roger, I mean, we'll pull two Gs around a turn. Yeah. Amazing, yeah, amazing on dirt, go -kart. right? Yeah, in a go kart, two Gs. Uh, not sometimes. That's pretty consistent from that's the data I always see. Well, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And, and interesting stuff, and I I think it's just. Um, uh, fantastic that some of the stuff you're doing we had some ideas that we were going to show some data and all that we're out of time but but uh, i i think our I, th I think no that's okay our conversation of 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 some of the different ways that this interacts i i think was more valuable so uh we do have um uh links to all of david's previous webinars he's done with us where he does share his data and he shares his user profiles there'll be a user profile that he has set up that is even more updated that uh, that will be linked in the YouTube uh, video here today. Matt's probably linked it in the in the in the live chat over there already for you to download and bring into Race Studio Three and and uh, and grab some of David's uh, dirt cart data and, and and play around if it's of interest to you. So it um uh, I appreciate you coming on here and and chatting with us about stuff like this. It's uh it's interesting how much is exactly the same whether we're talking racing hydroplanes up here in the northwest or dirt carts in the southeast or motorcycles and you know, all the different things we're all trying to, uh, to to attack this thing in the same way just what we do with it is, is slightly different sometimes so uh, i appreciate you coming you said something yeah. earlier to kind of close this down a little bit on on something you shared earlier i actually wrote it down after you said it i i don't know if anybody else heard it when we were chatting but you uh you talked about you went out the, to a new track and you snot lick them by half a lap i i, I have no idea what that means but um maybe you beat them really bad i i took it as you'd beaten them really bad i was uh yeah matt i was trying to figure that out too uh, i've i've heard a lot I'm of things I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm i've been around a little bit but that's when i had not heard of them in the past so that's uh that was pretty cool i'm, I'm glad i heard that so uh thank you david uh <laughs> pretty amazing if you were able to write something down while we're talking like i can't even multitask like that <laughs> Because you were doing all the work, right? So I, I could actually do a little bit of talking. I'm going to uh, reshare my screen here really quickly, and uh, and, and kind of chat as we uh, as we close this one up. The um th this video will be will be uh, placed up on YouTube as soon as we get done and um, joining uh, David's other three videos that he has and and something like 237 videos that we've already got out there. Um, so so take a look at that a uh, little bit later this evening. Share with anybody that uh, you think might uh, might enjoy this uh, and and uh, and enjoy seeing what we've done here. The uh, you've got David to to have some good customer support with if you're a dirt card oval guy. Obviously, we've got all of our aim aim support techs as well. Give us a call at 800-718-9090 if you have any problems. We we what what's really important to us is just like it is to David. 
boy, you've got this, uh, this, this hardware, this product, and uh, we want to make sure that you're getting the most out of it and, and, uh, and, and learn and, 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 and really make it get, give you the best service it can. So give us a holler if you're having any questions and, uh, and let's help you get it fixed up. So next webinar, we've, we've, we've already got this one kind of locked down, got the next couple actually locked down. It's going to be kind of a fun one. We're going to, um, it's, it's back to our morning one on April 30th is the, uh, is, is the next date that we're going to have one. And we're going to be visited by our old friend, James Colburn's going to come back and join us and, and co-host one of our webinars. He hasn't been here with us for, for, for a bit. James is, uh, uh, has his own YouTube site. He's from over in the UK, just does tons and tons of helping people just like, like David does of all, all sorts of different things. And one of the things that, um, James recently added to his Formula Ford was an SW4 steering wheel. And, and he's going to come on and talk about, you know, uh, the power of an aim dash at your fingertips is what we're, what, what we're kind of titling it. But, but uh, the cars are small. There's a lot of information in that steering wheel and a lot of things you can do with it. Of course, the data logger being built in. Uh, just thought we wanted to share that with everybody and show, uh, show a product that we haven't talked about a ton here on, on the webinar and, and uh, series and, 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 uh, and having James back to help us do that is, uh, is a treat for all of us. So look forward to seeing everybody here on the, on the, on uh, April 30th at 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. We're looking forward to that. And, um, and there's David in his natural element there. Uh, uh, and, and not the one on the left, but the, the one on the right with the family. But, uh, but uh, actually, there he is on the on the computer, though, on the side, side pod looking like every other racer that I know that uh, no matter what form of motorsports they have, they've got their, uh, they've got the stance there and, 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 uh, and reading data out near the race car. So uh, appreciate that. Uh, there's some contact information for everybody. There's uh, David's um, contact phone number and and um, uh, e email address and website. Uh, I know Matt had thrown in um, some of your social media links as well. I noticed that as time was going on. If anybody has any questions, make sure you give David a, a call. Talk to him about uh, some of the different things. He's a, he's a wealth of information and, and, and an enthusiast on this stuff. So, David, is there anything else you'd like to kind of add as we're uh, as we're kind of cleaning this one up? Um, man, I really appreciate you having me on, Roger. Uh, it's, it's a real, pro, a real uh, pleasure and honor uh, to be able to come in and talk data with you guys. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate Matt for coming in, man, and helping us out. Uh, he's my hero, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Matt Wolanowski is a role model. Uh, <laughs> You're doing but, a lot uh, of the same stuff that Matt does as well as, and supporting the different users as well, so I like that. But, uh, man, I really just I really appreciate it, and uh, thank you guys for, for allowing me to come on. Absolutely. Thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Look forward to having everybody come back uh, at, at our next one and, and looking forward to it. Everybody enjoy the rest of your evening or the whatever time it is in the part of the world that you're in. And uh, we will talk to you guys all later. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.